Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So this is a small point, but an important one. And it is simply that because something can be done, doesn't mean that it was done, or should be done. Uh, the example I'm going to use to illustrate this is the fact that sabres of the 19th century have a certain style of hilt to them, whereby there are various ways you can grip the weapon. Okay? Um, now, depending on which sources you look at, you'll find sometimes the so-called hammer grip, uh, in other words, gripping it like you would grip a hammer or any other kind of stick or tool, um, is used. Sometimes the thumb up grip is used. Get around the other side there, so you can see there. Sometimes the uh, sort of transitional, so switching between hammer grip and thumb up grip, or doing something more like a handshake, handshake grip, as it's become known in recent times, um, so that where the thumb is not fully up but is partially up is used. And those are all documented, but there is another type of uh, detail to gripping. Um, which is not covered very much in the English language sabre sources, or indeed as far as I'm aware in the, in the French language sources either, and that is gripping so you're very far down. Now, if you look at the shape of a sabre hilt, okay, you will see that very naturally you get a crook here, and very often the pommel is shaped up in such a way that it becomes quite comfortable to put your hand very low down on the grip. Now, this usually, certainly in British uh, and American and, and usually French sources as well, um, enables you to have more space to get your thumb up the back. The thumb up the back is pretty much always done when giving point or thrusting, and sometimes done in cutting in certain styles. So, for example, Burton does it pretty much all the time. Angelo switches in and out of it, um, and Hutton does it with the lighter sabre, but not necessarily always with the heavier sabre. And that's an important point to note as well, that if we look at weight, um, for example, he, he you know, specifies you can switch between these grips depending on the weight of the sabre and how manageable you find it, but that's a detail for another video. Um, but the point is that you have this crook down here that you can slip the hand into. Now, you could say, because we've got this shape, if we wanted to gain some extra reach and there's some extra length, probably by about an inch, and some of you will say, you know, an inch makes a big difference, um, no smutty jokes please, um, that you could slide the hand all the way down, whoop, all the way to the very end there, and hold it like a kind of pistol, okay, kind of like a pistol grip. And this is relatively insecure grip, but you could actually give point or give thrust still fairly securely. I can't really cut very well like this, but I could certainly manoeuvre the sword well enough to divert another person's thrust and put my own thrust in by gripping the sword entirely at the bottom of the hilt. Now this is of course where experimental archaeology and history cross. History is based on documented sources. Okay, uh, We can't we could surmise something might have happened, but we can never say something happened unless we've got it written in writing, from a historical point of view. From an archaeological point of view, we want to see archaeological evidence of it, which usually relates to evidence in the ground, or evidence in the artefacts, or on the bones. Um, experimental archaeology occupies a strange nebulous space whereby, through experimentation, we could say that a spear, or a sword, or any other object could be used in a certain way and you can demonstrate how it might work. However, I think it's very important to always remember that because something can be done doesn't mean it was done. Okay? And I see a lot of uh, videos on the internet put up about how ancient weapons could have been used and we must always caveat that with we don't know. Unless you find really hard supporting evidence for it in the artwork or in the textual sources, then you can never really say that this is how a weapon should be used with certainty. And I go back, I always go back to my shields and, and bucklers examples, but very simply we know that there were various different ways historically of using bucklers and shields. There wasn't only one way of doing it. So if we come back to the sabre for a minute, did anyone ever grip the weapon down there? Well, the closest that I'm aware to of that 
is that in the Swedish and perhaps in a couple of the German sabre treatises, they do seem to grip the weapon in the pictures, and I believe in the Swedish sabre material it's actually described, gripping it very, very far down. And if you look at Swedish sabres, if you just Google image search Swedish military sabre, you'll see they're not, this is the reason I picked this sabre, because this is, of the sabres I own, this is probably the most similar to a Swedish grip. They are actually really curved at the bottom and very obviously to accentuate gripping it at the very end of the weapon. And this is for thrusting and for cutting. They don't change the grip as far as I'm aware. But they do specify gripping very, very far down, which British and American and French sources do not. Um, at least none of them I've ever read do, that I've ever noticed at least. Um, so there is an example of the fact that if I had no sabre manuals available to me, I might pick up a sabre and go, oh, because of this shape here, I will use it like this. But that would be completely wrong for British military sabre fencing, because they didn't hold it like that. They didn't do that. In actual fact, they gripped it up here. They didn't grip it all the way down the bottom. Now, it might be correct for Swedish military sabre, but it's not correct for British military sabre or American military sabre. So there is an example of you can't simply invent techniques based on an artefact and say this is the way of doing it, because you may be completely wrong. And if we're looking at um, Viking era sword and shield or a hoplite era, era spear and shield, we can pick up, we can get the replicas of those weapons. The, the actual weapons themselves are fairly simple to replicate. But once we get those replica weapons and we start using them, we might devise a system that we think makes perfect sense for how you should use this sword or this spear and this shield. But that doesn't mean that the people who we're looking to recreate a system for, if that's at all possible, would have actually used them like that. Okay? We know that, for example, um, Highlanders used their basket-hilted swords and targes in a pretty damn different way to how Morozzo used a side sword with a rotella. And yet, fundamentally, they're similar combinations. It's a round shield of medium size and a, a, a cut-and-thrust double-edged sword with a somewhat developed hilt. Fundamentally, those objects are similar, but they were used in completely different ways. Equally, if we go back to the... Uh, if we go to rapiers, for example, rapiers Yes, you get cup-hilt rapiers and swept-hilt rapiers. There are some basic differences, but fundamentally it's a long-bladed, thrust-centric sword. And yet there's a wide diversity of systems for using them. The Spanish schools of rapier are really quite different to Italian rapier, and in turn very different to English, for example, Swetnam or Cavendish. Um, and of course there are similarities. There is, uh, there is um, crossover but there is a lot of difference as well. So, as always, I would say it's really, really risky basing conclusions about how weapons could have been used and saying with certainty, this is, this is you know, because of the effectiveness, I could show a certain type of cut with a, with a Viking sword or a certain type of um, thrust or stab with a spear and say, because this is really effective, they must have done this. No, not at all. History tells us otherwise. History tells us that different people, different groups of people, different regions, different areas, even different individuals, individual fencing masters, did things differently to each other. So all we can ever say is this weapon can be used this way, but we don't know if it was used that way, unless we have written textual support or very strong and repeated artistic support. Not one example, not two examples, but a set of examples to support our hypothesis. Cheers guys! Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook.